Welcome to episode eight of Marathon Talk, powered by Abbott World Marathon Majors. On this week's show, we kick off a coaching series helping you get ready for a spring marathon by digging deeply into the fundamentals of finding and following a great training program. Plus, Dina speaks to the current fastest female marathon runner in the United States, Emily Sisson, as she limbers up for the Houston half. We also chat about Majors candidate Sydney and their plan to lure the GOAT and the Kipchoge to their race and some sad news about one of Boston's most cherished spectators. Right, let's go. Dina, we haven't caught up since before Christmas. How are you and how was your running Christmas? A wonderful. Happy New Year, Martin. You too. You know, it was great. I went down to, to Arizona, which gave me a break in shoveling snow. But I was doing that Christmas tree challenge from the Global Run Club app. And I was at mile four on my way back down to a one mile run on Christmas Eve. And I fell on the asphalt so hard and banged myself up pretty well. I didn't start running until the new year. Oh, no, no. Falling over when you're running, particularly when you've got a little challenge, it does get a little bit disappointing, even if a bit painful. Yes. And I know, Martin, you're in your, um, you're in your office, which uh, is a little cold, but not as gnarly as here, where we have had 21 feet of snow this winter, you better believe my muscles are feeling the shoveling effects of, sh of shoveling our two decks. It, it comes springtime, I might take a sledgehammer to the decks on the front and the back of my house. So, so what happens when you get that much snow? Because like when I think we may have had this conversation previously, but it, we get we get one centimeter of snow and like, you know, my street comes to a complete standstill, one centimeter. You have 21 feet of snow. That's six and a half meters. Wow. <laughs> like, what do you, what does that actually mean for your day to day? Like, can you get out of the house? Do you, do you have to shovel your way out of the house? Yes. I woke up at 4.30 this morning and I shoveled both decks and the front door. And then our plow guy came at six o'clock in the morning and came right up to the cars so that all we have to do wow. is like shovel the little berm and, and can get out. I'm not going anywhere. Who wants to go anywhere? I'm just keep making hot cocoa and then green tea and then some cider. <laughs> and oh, I've already man. shoveled the decks twice. Does that mean that you can run from the house or you just don't leave it or do you get on a treadmill or you just don't bother? What happens? I am I am succumbing to the treadmill because it's a red day for school. We got three feet overnight and so um, there's no school today. So my daughter's home running on the treadmill, which is fine. But I, you know, if there were a park run today, it surely would have been canceled. Yeah. <laughs> And just can't get my head around that much snow because I've never lived in an environment with, with that much snow. And it must just, like, do you all just stay home? Like, <laughs> do you go out to work? Yeah. You go, how do you get your groceries? Like, are the roads cleared really efficiently? Like they are very efficient at snow removal. But this morning I was watching uh, people ski down the street to the chairlift. It was really, uh -huh. it's really fun to see. Like, the, the roads hadn't been cleared very well yet. And so people were just skiing and snowboarding down the street, which I love to see. Lovely. It makes me feel like I'm on vacation. Like I live in a resort town. I'm on vacation. But um, see, you do. You live in a mountain town. So, you know, whereas I live by the beach. So we never get snow unless it's a dusting perhaps once a year. But you do get to go to the beach over the holidays. So how was your holiday? Yeah, it was good. I went to Cornwall, which is in the southwest of, of the UK. In fact, we went to the little place. My my wife has some really good family links and we ran along. I did some running along the southwest coast path, which is my favorite place of all to be. I also did a park run in pool with my friend Tim. We ran around in about 23 minutes. So Great. it was enjoyable. He was fresh from the Jamaica Marathon. There's a marathon in Jamaica? <laughs> He just ran a marathon in Jamaica. Dina's, Dina's like, because she spent the last few weeks shoveling 21 feet of snow, her eyes have just gone like these big plates of enthusiasm over, wait a second. Yes, <laughs> like next year we should book a recording there. <laughs> <laughs> Sunshine, running, 
Oh uh, yes, so he, my my friend Tim was back from running the Jamaica Marathon, and so we went and ran his marathon legs off around Park Run in Pool in about twenty three minutes. Absolutely loved it. How beautiful! And so you're shaking out your marathon legs when marathon is over. I typically sit on the couch or sit on a beach somewhere, and your friend did a park run. Yeah, he'd had a few weeks to recover. He'd had Christmas okay. and things like that, but. Like he's got the easy, I mean, he, I'm glad he's not listening, but he has the shortest hamstrings on the planet. So <laughs> like when, when he's shuffling, he really is shuffling. It's like he's pedestrian, he's bent over, you, you know, you think, you, you think he's really struggling to, to get to the, the closest toilet, but it's not, it's just his super short hamstrings. <laughs> he's so got toddler we, hamstrings on an adult body. <laughs> he does have toddler <laughs> hamstrings. In fact, I will personally tell him that you said that. Oh. <laughs> you started it, Martin. You started that. After we recorded. By the way, Tim, <laughs> Tina says you've got toddler's hamstrings. <laughs> Anyway, come on, <laughs> let's move on with the rest of the show. It can be quite a quiet time of the year as far as news in the marathon running world goes, unless you're in Jamaica, but there have been a few bits that have caught our eye since the last show. And firstly, the Sydney Marathon, which is one of the candidates to become a new Abbott World Marathon major are not beating around the bush when it comes to trying to bring this race up to majors level. In the Sydney Morning Herald earlier this month, they said they're targeting none other than Elliot Kipchoge to race there in 2024. I just think that is the coolest story. I was so excited to to read this. He's doing Boston this spring for his fifth star, and he'll get his sixth star maybe in, in New York City later this year. But it is so exciting to know. I think he would have to do the Summer Olympics first, and then the Sydney Marathon would be after that. So he wouldn't be, right? Do I have that right? He yeah. wouldn't be disrupting his Olympic buildup because the Sydney Marathon would be afterwards. Yeah. I mean, assuming, I'm assuming he's, he's, um, he will be in the Olympics Paris next year. It would be his third, right? His third Olympic marathon. Wow. If he was to go to Paris next year. What would you do if he showed up at your park run one day? Take him down. You would. You'd try to go like for I'd your personal rinse, best that I'd day. I'd rinse him. Take him out hard. Absolutely. <laughs> Take him Just... out like... You know, seven minute miling pace. Just see, just, just see if he could see if he could stick with me for a while. I'd love it. Wouldn't it be amazing? I've never run with Eli Kipchoge. I mean, you've run with with loads of of African athletes, of course. And but one of the things for me when I run, when I have done that, is like slow running is slow, and fast running is really fast. So I'm I'm hoping if Elliot ever came to to my local park run, that he'd be on a slow day. It would be his recovery day and you could beat him and that would be your claim. <laughs> yeah. Claim to fame. Yeah. yeah, he'd be on a slow day. We'd have, and I, I think the only thing, you know, maybe you should offer him So I can't remember what they were. They were like pumpkin muffins, weren't they? Pumpkin cheesecakes at pumpkin my turkey cheesecake. trot. Pumpkin cheesecake, that's yes. the one. I'll bake him any, any sweets he wants, any pastries <laughs> he wants. I'll even invite him to Thanksgiving dinner if he'll come run our turkey trot. But he has to wear a turkey costume when he does it. <laughs> that's compulsory. That would be the caveat. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, uh, over to Boston. Now, I've not run Boston. Of course, it's an event you know well, but every year... Spencer the Golden Retriever is one of the stars of the show in Boston. And runners, they stop to take pictures with him. And he sits by the side of the road watching them as as, as he goes by. Uh, and then just in 2022, I nearly said this year, but last year in 2022, he was named the official Boston Marathon dog, which I didn't know was even a thing, but it clearly is. And he got his own bib and a goodie bag full of dog treats. He's such an iconic figure at the Boston Marathon. He stands there at the finish line with Boston, uh, BAA, Boston Athletic Association flags in his mouth. And everybody just adores Spencer. Even in 2018, when it was pouring rain, 
Spencer was wearing a raincoat and stayed outside to cheer on the finishers. I was not one of them. But it was so hard to read this story because Spencer, for the third time, is battling cancer. He's beat it before, so we're all cheering for him that he can get through this successfully as well. I bet there's a load of runners out there that will go, I know that dog. I've seen that dog. Uh, Well, I hope, Spencer, if you're listening, that you battle for the third time. I go running with, I've got a little dog called Ted. He's only small. And um, when we, he's a cross between uh, um, a Springer, Springer Spaniel and a Poodle. So he's like a small, curly, black thing. So is he called a Spoodle? He's called a Sproodle. A Sproodle. Okay. Yeah. I love that. And when we got him, uh, I said to Liz, look, I'd love a, a running dog. Like I wanted a German, like wire haired pointer. Okay, that's what I wanted. A hunting dog. dog. Yeah, like a dog we could run with. Yeah, you could hunt the competition. Run with me. (laughs) Liz said, this is the contrast. Liz said, I just want a dog I can love. Oh. And she's like, she wins that one. Yeah, so she got this little furry ball. And um, his legs are so small. He, he, I'm just checking. He's not in here. (laughs) He's not listening, but his legs are quite small. It's like he's, if Tim's got toddler's legs, then like Ted, <laughs> Ted's got like just really small dog's legs. He's yeah. Chihuahua legs. It's almost like he's got the equivalent of hamster legs on a dog. <laughs> so he's got really short legs. So it's, he's not really athletically built, but bless him, does he love a little run with us. We oh go my. running and Ted will cover four or five miles with us and he glides along like a little Kevin Keegan-esque gazelle. Oh my gosh. I love that he runs with you. That is fantastic. My dog doesn't last five minutes outside before he's like tugging to come back home and take another snooze. So if you want a dog to run with, an English Mastiff that is 140 pounds is not your dog. Is that what you have? Yes, but <laughs> but running's my profession. When I go out there, like I need to I need to think about splits and paces and if it's a day that I'm meeting my team, I can't bring the dog with me. So so for me, I've always wanted a dog that was a good sleeper because I could snooze in the afternoon with him. He could mm. sleep 10 hours a night without getting antsy and wanting to go out. So I need a sleeping dog. Yeah, well, Ted does a bit of sleeping, a bit of running, uh, a bit of both. So there you go. Ted's a good balance. Yeah, maybe your next run dog choice should be uh, should be a sprudel. Right, shall we talk a little bit about the age group world rankings? They're almost done for 2022. Yeah, runners only have until January 15th to make sure they've got their points earned for the 2022 Uh, World Championship Series. Make sure you update your runner's portal. They take the top two performances that will determine the final rankings. So make sure you go to worldmarathonmajors.com slash rankings to make sure your portal is up to date. In our last show, Dina and I spoke a little bit about training and we had some very good feedback from that. So this year, 2023, we thought we would put a bit more chat in the show around how to get ready for marathon running and the kinds of training that works and perhaps, you know, reflect on on some of those things. We really enjoyed our setting goals conversation. So we know it's tricky. We thought we would have a little bit of a conversation today around how to pick a training program, but the internet and, and podcasts can be a a little bit of a myriad of mind-boggling information that sometimes it's just tricky to navigate through and to really find genuine, trusted and, and reliable information. So you know, it's our hope that we're going to start to bring you a little bit more how-to advice in, in each show, which you will find valuable, we hope, particularly as you're preparing for a spring major or, or another spring marathon. And the focus for this episode is all about finding a training plan because Doing the actual training itself, that's what ties together your goals, your actions, and your aspiration. It really gives you some direction and strategy and purpose. And, you know, we we really feel that your running is something that you do with passion and devotion and energy and determination. So having a plan for that can really help you 
get to where you'd like in a way which would work for you, right? Absolutely. And so we'd love to just kick around some ideas on what Martin and I think are important. Like why even bother with a plan, right? And I think it's so important to have a plan because it gives your your entire build-up structure, but your day structure, right? You have to, you have to be accountable and get out each day and it allows you to to see progress over time. So I believe that without a plan, you're kind of lost. And when you have that plan in front of you, you can see that progress and really hold yourself accountable each day. And it guides you on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. I hadn't thought of that point of accountability quite so, you know, you brought it up a couple of times. It's it's really important, isn't it? We're, what we're suggesting here is that so, some of you might get a plan f- from, you know, perhaps a, a coach you work with. Some of you might get your plan from a book. You know, some of you might get it off the internet, but effectively, a plan is your guide. You know, it's your structure. It's your way of seeing how far you've come. And it's also your way of seeing how much you've done, right? It's, it's so important. A, a really important thing for me around what makes a good plan is that you have some ownership of that plan, that it's relevant and appropriate for you, for your goals and and your lifestyle. And that could be adjusted like to suit you, right? Yeah. And it is important because we all have different jobs. um, We have commitments to family and our community. And so to find a plan that that fits well in your life is going to allow you to to stick with it and to, to not get frustrated. If it's a plan that has you running twice a day, seven days a week, and you've got a full-time job and five children and, and, you, and you volunteer at the church, that's not really the best plan that fits your lifestyle. So finding that plan that really sings to you when you see it is really important, whether that's speaking with a coach or a mentor and building something together or finding something online or in a book that really looks doable, makes you think, this is going to be challenging, but I can commit to this. Commitment such an important part of, of a plan, isn't it? Because you know when you're served that plan or you get it for the first time, you want to be able to you sort of want to be able to commit to it. So that's why it being as personal to you is so important. Because I see, as as you probably do, like so many marathon runners who start a plan and it doesn't really fit. And before they know it, they're sort of deep into it, a few weeks into it, and they've realized it doesn't fit because everything hurts and, you know, they're really frustrated um, and it's not relevant and it's not appropriate for them. Like when when you were, Dina, when you were engaged in preparation for a specific marathon phase, like what was your approach to a training plan? Who wrote it for you and and sort of what were your golden rules for following it? So my coach was always the the creator of those plans and I adjusted my lifestyle to to fit those demands. And his philosophy, which was so important to my commitment to him over the years, was that our purpose here, our philosophy is to excel, is to be excellent. It's not to succeed. And that, and he had to explain the difference because I said, well, isn't success excellence? Like, but it's not. Like to be successful is to go out and run a marathon in, pers- in your personal best, right? But to excel, you sometimes have to give up that success to just build the strength, to build the endurance. And so each marathon buildup was had a slightly different focus so that I could be excellent, so that I can excel in the long run, get the best out of myself as a whole athlete, not just in that season. So it comes with a lot of discipline, following that plan each day, making sure you know what the goal and the purpose is in that buildup. Like you don't want to, this is going to be your first marathon, probably not a great idea to get jazzed by the Boston qualifier for your age group, right? That's the training plan I want. Well, let's let's ease into this a little bit and make sure that the experience is so great that you excelled in that in that training block so that it felt so good you want to come back and do it again a little better. I love the concept of discipline. You know, discipline and commitment to following a marathon plan, whatever your goal is, is really important. And for you, 
you know, when you were really digging into being the world's best marathoner, excellence at a global level was really important. And you said, well, I would adjust my lifestyle to fit the plan. And, and I guess there's a couple of things that come to life for me in that. And one is that you could, because your lifestyle was that of a full-time marathon, elite marathon runner, right? So you could. And for many people listening, that's much harder to do because their lives are constrained by the factors that you also mentioned, the social commitments, the work, the family. So, you know, when you're engaging in kicking a plan off, acknowledging the constraints and, and almost accepting them and considering that there will be pressure points to the plan is super important, isn't it? Like knowing when to tweak that plan. Yeah. And you know what that makes me think of is discipline is, is a really great value to have, but a greater trait is flexibility. So to have those hand in hand, like, okay, this, this obligation is, is really important. So I'm going to push my workout until tomorrow. I'm still getting it in. I'm just flipping my days a little. So it is these training plans should be a living, breathing thing. The structure is there for you to follow. Having the discipline is important, but the flexibility even more so. Yeah. And not being, you know, not feeling guilty or shameful about having adaptability, you know, you've really got to make a plan work for you, right? Let's talk a bit, a little bit about the specifics of, of a plan. You know, for me, sometimes I'll set plans that are typically 16 or 12 weeks out from a marathon, depending on the status of the, you know, the, the person that's running the marathon. And I, I, I don't mean that in terms of their status, but their, like their fitness, you know, their readiness. Readiness is probably a better word. Their readiness. I am breathing a sigh of relief because I just <laughs> obligated myself to the Paris Marathon and it's three months out. And I thought, oh my gosh, do I have enough time to prepare for it? And you just told me I did. So thank you for yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. 12 weeks. Was that, uh, that's about yeah. right. It feels right, doesn't it? 12 weeks. Yeah. Great. Was that Oof. typically for you how much you'd have started out with specifics of a marathon plan, 12 weeks? Yeah, it, but but I'm starting from a little lower place, like less fitness this time around. So maybe I, I could have used shoveling. a little bit more. Yeah, we'll see if shoveling transfers into um, a successful marathon. Yeah. The other thing that also, you know, you carry into a plan is it's almost your historical running experience and the number of you know, repeats, you may have followed, a, if you perhaps run two or three marathons a year, you'll have followed this cycle a few times. And that also stays with you, doesn't it? Yeah, you just keep building and building. The fitness from one marathon doesn't go away when you prepare for your next one. You just keep building yourself stronger and more enduring. So that's the beauty at sticking at this sport for a long time. 12 weeks out, how many times? Are, I mean, this is, of course, this is where a marathon training plan for a spring marathon, so like we're early January, mid January now. So we are in that 12 to 16 week period out for, for a, a, an April marathon. And what's very important is how many times should I run? I get that question a lot. How often should I run? Of course, what are the things that influence how many, how many runs should I do a week question? Yeah. And really to, to answer that question again, it's fitting into somebody's lifestyle, right? It has to fit, fit the, their work week, their busy week. And, and so the sessions should be catered to, to their lifestyles, but it's also important to touch on those different energy systems so that the training doesn't get boring. It not only helps build you more of a well-rounded runner, but the training gets boring. If you're just going to do mileage every day, there should be some speed sessions in there, some long runs, which are kind of your brain and butter marathon workouts, but the types of workouts you do are so important to mix it up. Do you think there's a minimum? So I reckon people always say to me, what's the minimum I can get away with? Like I think three, three runs a week in a marathon plan. If you could, the reason I think that is because if you're doing any less, like it's only a couple of runs a week. So if you aim for two and you miss one, right, which is quite common, if you've got a plan, and the plan only contains two runs, and you only run one of those, you're looking at only running 12 times. I mean, you wouldn't do that, right? So whereas three, four runs a week, I think puts you in a pretty robust place. 
And what would those runs, if you were going to limit it to three runs a week, how would you advise running those three days? Well, I'd like to think that the long run, you mentioned it's so important, isn't it? And it's got to be a main feature of a, of a marathon build-up. We're, like, you're asking your body to cover 42 kilometers, 26.2 miles. You know, it's a long time to be out. For many people, that will be between perhaps three and, I don't know, seven, seven hours. And so to prepare your body and your brain to, to be out for that long and cover that kind of distance, you've got to give yourself some exposure to that kind of duration. So yeah, the, the long run is really important. What we'll do in these training talks, I think, as we go through you know, the spring prep is to really get into some detail around what makes a long run up. We won't do that now, but we'll talk about that in the future. So a long run I would do, I would also do some paced work specific to marathon pace and faster and that could come in the form of some intervals. And then I think a third run would either be super easy, nice and relaxed and chilled and social. Um, and I'd probably switch the, if, if we were talking about just three runs a week, then that other run, the session run would, would either be something long and sustained, not super long, like four, five, six, seven, eight, depending on where you are in the progression of the plan, miles, but at a really decent sort of pace one that you find uncomfortable we'll talk on that we'll do another training talk i think as well about the different paces to train at because we won't get through everything but spreading the spreading the experience of pace in your training is something that teaches your body what it needs to do to run a marathon right you know you don't do all your training at marathon pace marathon race pace you might do some a little bit quicker and some out and some slower Right. And the, and the rest and recovery runs are so important. Uh, maybe not for the person that's running just three days a week, but when they're looking for the least amount of things that they could do, then maybe they um, weigh heavily rest already. But rest and recovery is just as important as the training itself. So making sure you're sleeping well at night, whatever it takes to do that, whether it's getting in those little rituals, listening to calming music before you go to bed, staying off your computer, all those little tactics, spraying lavender on your pillow. But rest is so critical to the recovery process. It's what allows you to come back stronger and allows your body to adapt more beautifully. Yeah, we should definitely do a sleep interview. We need to get a sleep doctor on, on board, don't we? Because, you know, sleep is so, so important. So yeah, we've got like 12, 16 weeks, a good plan should, should have that. A good plan should have a mixture of different types of paced runs that should progress over a number of weeks. Depending on your marathon race goal and your personal targets, well, that's the thing that really shapes the volume and the intensity of the, the, and the number of the sessions in the week and the, really the makeup of these. But essentially... You should be including some marathon pace work, some targeted sessions, um, and some, you know, gentle base building running and resting are so important. So what about if you've started doing a plan, we're kind of just a few weeks into January, so most people I would have thought may have selected a plan, but they won't be certain yet if it's right for them. Um, because I think it takes a little time and sometimes you pick a plan and it, <laughs> I, I will always urge people to pick a plan that they believe they can commit to. So sometimes somebody will say, hey, I can run six times a week and they'll get all bravado about it. And, you know, they'll get to the middle of like end of January and they'll just be busted because they've bitten off a little bit too much. So, you know, with any plan, it's the consistency of execution throughout the entire plan that makes the biggest difference to the successful marathon outcome. But what about if you've picked a plan? How do you know like, when it's not going to be the plan for you and what should you do about it? Right. And marathon training is always hard. It should be challenging. So first, like, think to yourself what you need to do to try to stick with it. If, it's, if it feels a little daunting, 
maybe you need to play with your paces a little bit or sleep a little better. Like look at how you can adjust to stick with the program because I think a lot of times we're looking for an out and we don't really need it. We need to look for that in. We need to look for the way that we can recommit and especially in the early stages of the year, early stages of training, keep reinforcing why you're doing it and really try to keep refocusing. And I think in my own experience, when uh, my training plans seem to get boring or daunting, I, I always need to go explore a new place. So I strap on my shoes. Sometimes I even take my watch off and go run in a new neighborhood, run on a new trailhead. Sometimes just freshening it up on that, on that stage does it immediately for me. Buying a new outfit that makes me feel fresher and faster to run in, a fresh pair of running shoes instead of the ones mm -hmm. that have 400 miles on it from my previous training session. Like try to try little tactics like that to try to revamp your spirits. But if the training plan isn't working, I think you'll you'll know by the end of that session. Yeah, you do, don't you? I think you know, there's factors in your form, there's factors in your fitness, like there's factors in how you're feeling. Often, you know, these are signs that your, your plan, your training isn't right. You might, you might not be sleeping. You might be feeling rubbish every time you go for a run. You might be feeling like hot spots in muscles or joints and you've just been overreaching a little. You know, you might just be playing bored and lethargic and the plan just not doing it for you. It's so important. Adapt, flex, change, you know, back off. I, I do sometimes think, well, I do not sometimes think, I think that showing up regularly is the most important part of lots of things we do, right? Like keep showing up, keep showing up, keep showing up. And having that capacity to endure and to train hard and to have amazing discipline, but also to know when you do need to listen and you do need to say, hang on for today, that's enough. And in the most extreme cases, I think people should be, you know, adapting their plan more fully by preempting, you know, that 10 days later when they're going to be injured or broken and saying, no, I do need to back down and maybe even change the plan. Yeah, I would love to dive into that even more on another session together. I'm so glad you said keep showing up because I asked Emily Sisson the one thing the sport has taught her that she knows to be true. And that was what she said. When you keep showing up, you just keep getting better. And so I thought that was great that you capped off this, this little bit of our podcast with with that, but then also having a caveat to it, right? We we can talk ourselves into and out of anything, but know when it's just your motivation waning, or know when it's your body breaking down because you're asking too much yes. of it. And that's a hard that's a hard balance to to make as a runner. It is a great privilege to start the year off in a big, big way. I get a chance to talk to Emily Sisson on this episode of Marathon Talk. She is an Olympian in the 10,000 meters, and last year in 2002 broke the American record in both the half marathon and the marathon. It's a new year ahead, and I'm excited to know what goals she's aspiring to reach this year, how she keeps motivated after reaching such highs in the sport, and how she manages her expectations. I think we'll learn a lot in this episode with this great guest. Emily, happy holidays, happy new year, and welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me on, and happy holidays, and happy new year to you, too. Yeah, so this is the first episode of 2023. It is a new year, and I would like to know how you approach a new year ahead when you have this fresh start, a blank slate. How do you see the year ahead? Yeah, the new year is a good time just to kind of reflect and kind of reassess like how things are going and um, what things are working, what goals you have ahead. It's always like a good checkpoint. I feel like that all of this, um, all of this kind of used to reassess. And uh, yeah, New Year's been good. I'm with my husband and our dog down in Scottsdale right now, training and planning the year ahead and even the year after that. So just getting to work and dreaming about what's next. I guess, yeah. 
Yes, the year ahead and the year after that, an Olympic year. Um, you have just solidified the last episode of last year that Mart and I had on reflecting on the year and how you can learn and grow from the highs and the lows. So there you hear it from the American record holder in the marathon that um, that it's a good time to reflect and and grow as a as a runner. Did you make a New Year's resolution or are you totally against those? I'm not against them. I just don't usually make resolutions because I'm kind of constantly looking like reassessing and uh, after like any big race, like what did I do well? What would I like to do better? So it's almost like a constant thing I do setting a uh, new new resolution throughout the year. So I don't have one resolution, but I do have um, like I have thought about how I want to like approach my next races and what I want to change and do differently from last year and what I thought I did well. So so no res resolution, I guess, long story short, but definitely things I want to focus on with like the year ahead. And hopefully it's still going well because we are only two weeks into the new year. So hopefully listeners have held on to those resolutions so far. What is a, a good way to, to fall into those habits and not fall out of them? You know, it's easy to like make those little changes and then you get kind of tugged back to the to the person that you were and you're like no I want to keep growing how do you how do you stay focused on on growth constantly I think just making little changes at a time and not thinking like five steps ahead like okay now after a marathon build it's actually a good time for me to look back and be like what did I do well what do I think I could have done better and um like each build up and each, uh, if it's not even a marathon, it's a half marathon I'm getting ready for. I'm like, okay, what is the one thing I kind of want to focus on like this time? And each time kind of playing around with something small and little that I could change or do better or um, even tweak just with like my mental like performance, stuff like like starting small, I guess, is uh, what I'd advise. And then just kind of doing like small, like achievable tasks to kind of help make it stick. And uh, And then you can keep like growing from there. And maybe instead of making like one big, big goal right off the bat, just start with something small, a small, easy everyday action. Maybe it's like changing like a thought process you have in your head or just um, trying to reframe something, something small like that, and then kind of go from go from there. Yeah. What do you what do you think is your greatest mental strength? If since you just went there, what do you think is your greatest asset that's in your head? I think I'm. I'm really good at focusing on a task at hand for like a long period of time, which I think is handy in, uh, in this sport. And I feel like I'm pretty good at looking at something realistically head on and knowing like what I did well and what I need to improve on. The one thing I try to constantly work on is like always choosing to look at the more optimistic side, the more positive side, because naturally I feel like I can see both like the positive and negatives in a situation. So for me, I've always had to work on, well, let's focus on the positive. <laughs> so, um, and, and even this past year, there've been examples of races where things weren't going really well, either in training or like the day of, and instead of focusing on what didn't go well or what wasn't perfect, like, let's focus on, okay, what, like, what did we do well? What, what did, uh, what went well going into this? Um, and choosing to look on the positive side. It's probably not something that always comes naturally to me, but it's, a, it's something I'm very aware of. And, uh, it's a choice I try to make every time. So yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I think is it's human nature to be self-critical and even like fight or flight, that response that we have naturally as human beings. But it is a lot of work, but well worth it <laughs> to to yeah. change those thoughts and be optimistic because science does show that that there's a lot of great things that come, that physical response with a positive thought that follows. So I'm I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned that. And I think what impressed me, if we're gonna speak mentality, is how you went in to the Chicago Marathon 2022, and you really had questions from journalists, and there was all this buzz around you going to break the record, and you were so calm, cool, and collected with managing those expectations going into the race. And in a new year, we all have high expectations to, to do great things in our careers, in our, in our family life. And you were just so smooth in that press conference and then went out and ran exactly that same way. It was like, okay, I'm going to be on this pace. And if I feel good, yeah, I'm going to go after the record. So can you talk about how you manage those expectations on the fly? Like, I just was so impressed with your composure and how this big dream was right there, but 
But plan B would have also been okay. And and it was in the works early in the stages. So how do you do that? Oh, well, thank you. I I actually probably need to give a lot of credit to a friend of mine, Roisin McGettigan Dumas. She's an Irish Olympian. Do you know Roisin? Yeah, Roisin, she is. Yes. I worked with her for probably like five, six months, like right after college. Uh, she is a sports psych coach. And I went to her because I actually, going into any big race, I'd get so overwhelmed. Um, even if I wasn't the one that was uh, with the target on my back going into a big race, I'd still get overwhelmed by all the, the media and... Uh, the expectations and a lot of the noise, I guess we called it, that goes around a big event. And she really helped me reframe it in my head. And that like that has made like a world of difference. And I've talked about this on other podcasts in the past, but she told me going in any big race, like focus, think of yourself as like the eye of the storm. And uh, there's all this noise going on around you. Um, you're at like interviews, media, I don't know, whatever. Uh, and she's like, it's OK that that's there. You can acknowledge it's there and you can even acknowledge the positive uh, side of it, how it's really good for the sport that it's getting this attention and um, helping promote it and build it up. But you don't have to let it affect you. So show up to your interview, show up to the press conference, do your best and then go back to your room and like hang out uh, with your husband, watch TV, read a book, whatever it is that helps you relax. And uh, and so that's kind of how I used to view it before I'd go in any race was just being like the eye of this hurricane. And uh, now I don't have to think of it so much. It's just kind of like naturally how I am. But it's something that I did have to work at. It didn't come naturally to me. And I think even the weekend of that race, like I knew my goal going into Chicago was first and foremost to actually just break 220. And I knew if I like said I was going after the American record, it would probably make for a better story. But that genuinely wasn't my My main goal, my main goal is just to have another positive experience in the marathon since it had been so long for me. And uh, and so I think just not giving in on that and saying what I felt like was the right thing to say, even though in my heart, that's not how I felt. Yeah, I think all of that probably helped. But yeah, I definitely I'm someone that gets overwhelmed by like too much like stimulations. (laughs) So I had to work at it for sure. Yeah. And all these major races are in big cities. So that alone, like just walking to go get a cup of coffee can be overwhelming. I feel that way in New York City, just crossing the street to get an Americano and a croissant. I just feel so ultra stimulated by the city. And I can't wait to go back to my little mountain town to have some quiet time. But I'm going to visualize myself next time I'm in a big city being in the eye of that storm. Roisin is has definitely done such great work with you and a great athlete herself. We were talking before we started recording that you just had coffee with Molly Huddle, another great mentor for so many in this sport. What kind of example has she led for you? This is like such a circuitous community that we're in that we just keep inspiring and being inspired by others. What has she taught you in this sport? I always find that question so difficult because I can't think of just like one thing off the top of my head. It's really just been like she's like shown me the ropes. And as like a young, like 22 year old coming out of college, like I had no clue what what like it meant to be a professional runner and how to carry yourself and how to train and compete at the highest level. But she showed me just like how she handles things like she makes things look so easy. And I've always said that about her, like she always makes it look like it's effortless, but she works so hard to make it look that easy. And so just getting like an up close like view of that, can you see how she handles like setbacks, like getting sick right before a big race or having a little injury pop up or um, anything, just like seeing how she handled setbacks at all and how they just she kind of just like took it in stride. Like I thought that was really cool to see. I I love like her approach to running. I love how she's just very even keeled down to earth. Like she's just so um, just so like easy to talk to. And uh, I've always like admired that and uh, kind of that big picture approach. I think it's easy for runners in general for us to get a little television <laughs> television if that makes sense but being around her i feel like she always just has such a good perspective about things so i'm lucky that she uh she was my mentor and still is i guess and i'm lucky she like let me just follow her around and run with her and it's not like i was always asking her a bunch of questions i was more just like watching how she did things and that's the best way to learn i think is to, wrap, to surround yourself with people like a lot better than you a lot smarter than you and just see how they do things and so i'm really lucky she let me do that Absolutely. And when I think of her, like she's a, 
she's a, a great mentor in the fact that you can just observe what she's doing and she just leads by such great example, but very gracefully. I feel when I, when I look at her, she's a gritty racer, but she's graceful in everything she does on and off the, the track or the, or the roads. I painted my nails and every time I paint my nails, I think of her because that's the thing she does before races, right? She, she has a very deep thought about selecting her color and how she's going to paint her nails before race day. <laughs> Yeah, they always look really good, especially compared to mine. They definitely look good. But if we're going to go back to Roisin for a second and being in the eye of that hurricane, do you feel like you're in the eye of the hurricane yet? Because very soon you are leaving to compete at the Houston Half Marathon. When this episode releases, it'll be Friday. And so you will be racing that weekend. How do you feel going into this race? Do you feel calm still? Yeah, I feel, I mean, I'm excited. It's been a while. I, I guess not that long. It was only back in October that Chicago happened. But to me, it feels like a while since I raced last. So I'm just really excited to race again. Um, I'm not actually very, sh- like, I'm not sure where I'm at training wise. So that'll be kind of fun. Though. Sometimes it's nice going into a race, just being like, well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of how I feel about this one. So I am excited. I'm sure once I get there, like it's kind of that same routine, but it's not quite as uh, chaotic and hectic as marathon weekend because because it is a half marathon. So it won't be quite the same level of intensity. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited for it. I'm looking forward to it. So I was going to follow up with, do you think you're in personal best shape, but you already, that would be my roundabout way to saying, are you going to try to lower the American record in the half marathon? But this is just to see how training is going. It's the beginning of the year. You've got a lot, a lot of miles ahead in the calendar year. So um, it's such a great race though. Houston puts on such a fantastic race. The the organizers, the volunteers, it's definitely up there as one of the, one of the best in our country. So do you taper for a half marathon? Um, I do, but it's nowhere near as much as for a marathon. It's the three days before I just run a little bit less. But yeah, it's not uh, not the full two week taper that we do for marathons. And uh, I definitely prefer the three day taper. <laughs> it's it's not enough time to get like grumpy and panicky that you're that you're losing fitness or something. Yeah, all the yeah. all the panics <laughs> that come in. I'm not a fan of the marathon taper. I feel physically really good during the taper. Like my body feels like um, I have more like of a pep in my step, but I just get so like bored and I feel like I have all this energy and I have nothing to do with it. So that's something I'm trying to figure out. I heard someone once, I think it was Sarah Hall, say like you feel like a caged animal, like you just want to unleash your fitness. And I'm like, that's how I felt the two weeks before Chicago. That's fascinating because for all the years since 2001, when I started marathon running, I always expect to feel caged and pep, have that pep in my step that you're talking about. I have never felt that. I always feel sluggish and tired and even like a mild headache. It's the most bizarre thing. Uh, I hear everyone, the taper is different for everyone. So you could talk to 10 different people and they have 10 different experiences. So, um, but yeah, physically, I feel good. I just, feel like I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> yeah. So what are what are some tactics in that taper? Do you do like, do you read more books? Do you do puzzles? Uh, my husband actually got me Legos for the last taper, which uh, he thought was, he's a therapist. <laughs> so <laughs> it's funny. He's like, this works really well for my clients. <laughs> it's kind of meditative because it's not like it's like a very challenging thing to do. It's more just like you're really focused on what's in front of you because you have to be like reading instructions and connecting Legos. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah, he got me this like huge set. Like I forget how many pieces are in it, but I like, yeah, I just did Legos for like two weeks. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's because you're really good at the task at hand, right? So yeah. that's you focusing on the task at hand that isn't exerting any energy so you can continue to store it for marathon day. That is so great. I bet Lego stocks go up after, after the release of this podcast. <laughs> I'm willing, I'm willing to bet. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. So you are going to Houston this weekend. Will you be returning to Arizona after after the half marathon? So uh, going to Houston this weekend, and then I'll be returning to Arizona. Uh, I think actually the Flagstaff. Uh, actually, no, I'll be in Scottsdale for two more weeks, and then I'll go up to Flagstaff February 1st and uh, be there until my spring marathon, I think. Maybe come down to sea level for like two weeks before the spring marathon. But yeah, in Arizona. Okay, stay tuned for Emily's Spring Marathon 
uh, release. And so it has been a tough winter everywhere across the country. I am the victim of that. I have done more miles on my treadmill than than any year prior. But do you have any winter running tips? You were in Providence for a long time. How did you stay motivated in the winter? Were there any any tips that other people gave you that you're looking forward to to implementing if you're in Flagstaff later later in the month? What are what are some tips that you have for people who are just maybe lacking motivation or just don't know how to keep going in the winter? For motivation, because a lot of the miles are done on treadmills, uh, when it is like snowy and icy, I do recommend having like a really good playlist or like or if you prefer podcast, just having a good um, podcast to listen to because that can help. I know some people have like love hate relationships with treadmills and I'm kind of that way too. I get like a bit, bit bored running on them, but if I have a good playlist to listen to you just to like get me through the run, I find that helps a ton. And also just accepting like it's the time of year everyone has to be a bit flexible. So it can be frustrating at times having to like move workouts around because of a snowstorm or it's the time of year everyone gets sick too. So if you come down with something and you, you have to push like a workout back or move things around. I don't know why, but for some reason, those little things seem to frustrate me a lot. And I just remember, no, like, this is part of it. Like, everyone goes through this. You're not the only person that has to move a workout back. Um, and just kind of, like, accept, like, okay, like, I'll just be a little bit more flexible right now. And that's okay. So I think those are probably my two biggest tips, having a good playlist and uh, being willing to be flexible during um, the winter months. Right, because you'll eventually get the work in. You just might have to flip your days, flip your days around a little bit. Have you ever gone out and just embraced the snow? I haven't since I was in college, but that's only because I'm pretty clumsy and I just I slip a lot. So after a few falls, I was like, I'll just go on the treadmill. But I, I do enjoy it. It is beautiful out when it is it is snowy. So maybe when I retire someday and I don't have to worry so much about um the injury risk, <laughs> I'll do that more. Yeah. I'm pretty much a baby in the ice, but it, we have groomed cross-country ski trails and I'll go out if they're packed down solid enough, I'll go out with some yak tracks on my shoes or something. And if it's a, like an easy three or four mile run in the afternoon, I love, I actually feel gnarly doing it. You know, like you come back and you're like, I just did that. Instead of logging those boring miles on the treadmill, it's, um, it's pretty, pretty exciting. But I fell in Arizona when I was there before Christmas on a smooth paved road. It was a little gravelly, but it was a paved road. And I fell so hard. I still have bandages all over my body and only started running on January 1st. So um, oh, you don't, it doesn't just take ice to bring you down. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, though. That's, that's a bummer. That's frustrating. And you know what? It was because I was house looking. I love looking at houses when I run through neighborhoods. What are your favorite places to run? Do you like trails? Do you like exploring cities? Probably, I'm going to guess not exploring cities, but what's your favorite place to, to explore? I love dirt roads, which we have a lot of in Flagstaff, but I'm also like the type of person that if I have like a couple people to run with, I could be running anywhere and then I don't mind the scenery as much as like the company can make up for that. Uh, but if I am running alone, I do like dirt roads. I'm not great on single track trails also for the tripping hazard, <laughs> but, uh, but I love dirt roads. Like I love running in Flagstaff. It's like, it's really beautiful. So uh, it's a nice part of the country to train. Yeah. And it's so nice that your husband Shane is there with you, able to, able to travel with you. So great that you guys have that flexibility to pick up your things and go to where I think you're called a snowbird. Yeah, we're snowbirds. <laughs> I'm going to call you a snowbird, but talk to the importance of having support and not everybody can have it in their spouse, but they could find it in going to a local running store and finding a group to run with. Talk about having support in a sport that looks very individual, what that support means to you. The support, I don't, I wouldn't be able to do this without the support. And I'm lucky that I have a very supportive husband, but, but it doesn't, like I learned, it doesn't have to be a big group to feel like you have support. Just having like one friend who wants to uh, meet up with you early before work for a run or when it's like not great weather out or a friend to even go to the track at the same time as you, if your workout's not the same, just having company um, and someone, whether it's a teammate, a husband, a girlfriend, like a coach there to like help like give you company when you're doing like a hard workout. I anything really. It I'm always been someone that it's quality over quantity for me. So if I have like one or two friends to run with, like I'm good. Like that's great. <laughs> like I love having support in like a couple people. So I like reach out in your community. Like going going to a run store is like like you said, a great idea. Or even like going online and seeing if there are any groups 
that like meet up in your area, like any run groups, that it, just anything to like connect with people. I think that helps make the miles go by faster, the work seem easier, anything that helps with like it, mentally it helps a lot. I remember I was actually really tired the other day. And then when I met up with Molly, like I just like got out of my own head and I forgot how tired I was <laughs> because like you're just distracted, like catching up with people and it makes it more fun. So yeah, it doesn't have to be a husband, but having even just like one person that can hold you accountable to meet up with can be really helpful. Yeah, it does make the miles go by faster. And I was even just thinking as you were talking that it could also elongate careers because it it is social and and engaging as opposed to being isolating. So it can actually keep you in the sport a lot longer by by connecting with others and having that support. Yeah, I agree. I, I know you're in uh, probably the bulk of marathon training, half marathon and marathon uh, training. Are you craving a break yet or you're excited about still being in it? No, I'm excited. I feel like I'm actually not in the bulk yet. I feel like I I know I've been training for a couple of months in Chicago now, uh, but I keep having like little things pop up, like a little sickness here, a rolled ankle there that kind of like keep me from getting into a groove. So I just definitely don't feel like I'm over trained or anything if anything I feel like I kind of want to like pick things up and do more so I guess that's a good good spot to be heading in to a marathon build up soon but I do enjoy my breaks after a big race like I really do enjoy that time and I don't feel like rushed to get back in the training right away I take the time after a marathon or a big half marathon or after the Olympics to just spend time like with my family and friends and really actually socialize which is harder to do when um, I'm training a lot so I enjoy that downtime. And then um, once I'm back into training like I am now, I'm kind of just eager to uh, get into it, I guess. Yeah, it's a good it's a good balance to be free and engaged with so many people that you can't spend time with when you're so focused narrowly on training. It's a good balance. And I remember sometimes my husband having to nudge me a little bit, like it's time to start getting back to work now. <laughs> Think about what you want to yeah. what you want to do. Party's over. <laughs> <laughs> so that's for after marathon. So fun to to get together and spend downtime with family. How do you spend recovery days? Like some of your time off of running in your day. I know it's a pretty big job because even napping and getting massages is all part of it. Yeah. But how do you spend some of that? time to kind of just like tune out and and balance in the day. I am pretty good at like when I'm not working, not thinking about work too much. So it, it is like a full-time job and that I'm running. And then, like you said, doing, I get body work, I get a massage, I have to go to the gym and do all that stuff. But when I'm not running, I'm probably at home, like relaxing with my dogs on the couch, watching like either a Netflix show or reading a book, nothing too exciting because I can't do anything that expends too much energy. Uh, but then I save all the, like the really fun stuff for after, after like a marathon. Then I then I'll go do stuff with my friends or like go travel to visit family. And um, that's where it kind of like can recharge. But during most days, it's like it sounds a bit mundane, but I do enjoy just like hanging out with my dogs on the couch and like reading a book or um, I don't know, just doing something like that. Doing a puzzle even can be kind of fun. I save Legos for the tapers, but <laughs> that's probably a new hobby. <laughs> I'm now going to start. Uh, just something like that. But I'm pretty good at not. Uh, once I'm done with work for the day, I don't go home and like talk about splits or think about the workout. I kind of just like keep moving forward and uh, keep moving throughout my day. And I think that's, um, yeah, that's pretty good. Do you think that Legos before big races is now your new superstition? Uh, maybe. Yeah, I think that, <laughs> like I did enjoy it because it took my mind off of just thinking about how I was just so antsy and so bored. So um, I think, yeah, that'll probably be my new pre-race thing because it worked well <laughs> the last time. They certainly worked well. And you had such a successful year last year. If you were to look not just at last year, but your whole career has been so successful from college to now. What does success mean to you? How would you define success? Because even if even if we fall short of a goal, it was still like sometimes it's still like a really it was a good draw. You drew a lot out of yourself. So how do you define success? Yeah, I think my definition of success has changed a lot throughout my career. When I was younger, like it meant just like just achieving things Um, like I wanted to do all these things. And now as I've gotten older, I, I realized to me, like the fun part is actually like chase I don't like using the word chasing a goal but like kind of going after a goal and like trying to learn as much as I can like how can I be a better runner what did I learn from this past buildup and like what um kind of piecing things together like how I can 
keep getting stronger and keep like enjoying competing at this level for as long as I can. And uh, when I do achieve something that's really cool, like making an Olympic team or setting like the record in Chicago, that was really cool. And that was really special. But it, like more looking back on that build up, I'm like, that was really fun. I had a great time, like just training hard, catching up with friends in Rhode Island and just working with my husband towards something together. And and I want to keep doing that, keep making it fun, because if you lose sight of the whole, like, I know it sounds cheesy, but the journey, then then it's all work and all like accomplishment. That's not like sustainable, I don't think, in my eyes. You need to keep things, at least I need to keep things fun. So I think for me, success is being able to en- keep enjoying this process. And sometimes it's easier than others. Sometimes you're dealing with an injury or sickness or something. And that's I know it's not quite as enjoyable then. But at the end of the day, looking back and being like, that was fun. Like, I enjoyed that. And uh, getting to, like, share the special moments when you do achieve things with your family and friends. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. But (laughs) yeah, absolutely. Is that do you think that that's what keeps you continuing to strive like that? These great things that you've achieved haven't been career capping because it still is fun. You're still looking for for small ways to to grow, to take those little steps to to create big dreams. Um, is that why you're still at it? I think so. I think because I find like the sport so interesting and so fun that yeah, I just keep wanting to like learn how can I like after Chicago, I'm like okay, now how can I be competitive? Like so that's kind of the focus this year. Is I'm not thinking so much about records right now. I'm like, okay, uh, at Houston Hap, how can I be competitive with the women that are showing up on that day? What can I do to keep growing as an athlete? And I think switching things out, not being afraid to like try new things, not being afraid if things don't work out. Um, I, it keeps it kind of fun and interesting for me. And um, yeah, I think that helps with longevity, making sure you're enjoying it at the end of the day. And also, yeah, just enjoying it with your people, like your support group, the people around you too. I think that's important. Do you think because you're kind of sandwiched in between a year where you broke American records and an Olympic year, this is that in-between time that it's kind of a year that you can have fun and take some risks? Yeah. Yeah. I kind of want to just like experience more. I feel like I lack a lot of experience in the marathon. So that's kind of how I'm viewing this year. I'm like, let's just, I don't know, let's just learn some more. (laughs) Let's just experience some more things. I'm not going into Houston with like a time goal or anything. I just want to compete against everyone that's around me. Like, I'm hoping that'll go well, but we'll see. If there's anything I've learned off the last year, it's just like, okay, let's just have fun now. Let's just like put yourself out there and see what can happen. One thing I'm actually really proud about from last year was actually the half marathon I did in Indianapolis. My training before that race like hadn't been going well. Uh, I was just coming back from COVID and I was really struggling in all my workouts. And I think I'd only finished like three of them before the race. And I was like, but you know what? Like, what's the worst that can happen? Why don't I just go out and race? And um, it was a record attempt that day. But I was like, if I don't get it, like, I've already missed the record once by a second. I don't know if it gets harder than that. <laughs> so I might as well just try. And I think I was, like, proud of myself for, like, putting myself out there and trying something, even though, like, training hadn't been perfect. So I kind of am just looking at this next year. Like, let's just put yourself out there. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Assuming training and everything goes well, I'll just keep trying that, I guess. Oh, man, as a fan of the sport and a fan of you, that makes me excited to watch you the rest of the year. (laughs) Emily, I want to be mindful of your time since you've got a travel week coming up, but I have one final question, and it's not meant to stump you, but it's kind of like a bigger question on if you look back, this sport continues to teach us, which is why you're still at it. But if you look back at all your years of running, what one thing do you know to be true? Ooh, that's actually a tough one. Well, I know if you keep showing up and you keep, I, I know it's like a Des Linden thing. If you keep showing up enough times and putting yourself out there, some days like things won't go to plan. Some days things aren't going to work out, but odds are like some days things are going to work. So just like keep putting yourself out there for those days where things come together, where you feel good. And um, I guess like for me as someone that, especially when I was younger, was such a perfectionist and was always like looking for things to be perfect it's important to know like, hey, just like show up, give it your best. Odds are some days it's going to work out. So just keep giving yourself a shot, I guess, is the one thing I know to be true. Amazing. And uh, and it's so true uh, because you did that with the American record in the half marathon. Des Linden did it in Boston in 2018, was thinking of dropping out 
and decided to stick with it a little longer for another mile and ends up winning the Boston Marathon, a dream she'd been attacking for so many years. So to keep keep showing up and understanding that it doesn't have to be a perfect day to reach your dreams and your goals. It doesn't doesn't have to be flawless. There can be some hiccups and challenges along the way. Yeah, exactly. I was there that day, like when Des won. I was there actually in New York when Shalane won too. And both those days, I was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. So yeah, just keep keep showing up, I guess. Stealing Des Linden's boat there. <laughs> that's okay, but you have a different voice to do it. So that's fantastic. Well, Emily, best of luck to you at the Houston Half Marathon and the rest of this year. I hope it's everything you dreamed of. And thanks so much for being on Marathon Talk. Thanks for having me. Right, that's it for episode eight of Marathon Talk, powered by Abbott World Marathon Majors. Dean is going to be out shoveling snow, but what else is going on? Oh, yes, shoveling snow. And I have three months until the Paris Marathon. So I'm going to be getting myself back into fitness so that I can go enjoy some croissants, cappuccinos, and kilometers in Paris. <laughs> Brilliant. And don't forget, little bottle of French red. Come on. That might make its way into the agenda. Yes. Are you Paris Marathon running for fun? Are you Paris Marathon running fast? Like what's the what's the target? So far I'm running Paris Marathon for fun with a lot of my ASICS family. There's a big contingent Lovely. from ASICS America going out there. So whether I'm pacing one of those friends to a personal best or or going a little harder, I'll see how the next month and a half pan out. You're going to keep your powder dry. Yeah. Great. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be choosing some targets. Uh, I haven't quite got it yet. We did mention it on the show last time. I, I, I want to do something run-wise this year, but I haven't really applied myself to really thinking about it. I've got an opportunity to go running in Switzerland that I might take. I don't know. I'm choosing some running targets and I'm continuing to wrestle the winter. The winter is the worst time for me to run. It's just not like... Lately in the UK, it's been raining every day. I've got like four pairs of completely drenched, stinking trainers that I just can't get dry. So I've just taken to leaving them outside all the time. I don't know if this tactic will work for you, but when it is gloomy, if I'm staying in a gloomy place, we get 300 days. As much as we get snow, we get 300 days of sunshine here. But when I'm in a gloomy place, it really wears on me. And uh, I usually go to the farmer's market or the grocery store even and get a little mason jar with a couple of sunflowers in it. And it's like my artificial sunshine in the middle of the kitchen so I can just look at it all the time. So buy yourself some sunflowers or maybe I'll send you some. Yeah, I need some sunshine. Speaking of sunshine, we know that running gives you that. So enjoy the run wherever it takes you. 